Hi everyone. Thanks for thanks for inviting me here. It's 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 it's, it's great to great great to see all of you. Um, so yeah. So the title of the talk is self-similar solutions to extension and approximation problems. But the real trick behind the talk is that you know you wouldn't look for self-similar solutions. You wouldn't look for non-smooth solutions unless you couldn't find smooth solutions to whatever problem you're looking for. And so really the trick of the talk is that we are, uh, we're, we're, we, we want to look for, uh, we want to look at problems where there aren't smooth solutions and show that sometimes there are still non-smooth solutions to those problems. Uh, so it's about finding wild maps, wild solutions to extension and approximation problems that, that have structure at a lot of different scales. And so this is um, sort of this, this sort of originates in a construction of Kaufman uh, from the 70s of rank one maps from the cube to the square. Uh, and then I want to apply it to a couple other contexts. I want to apply it to uh, topologically non-trivial low rank maps. And I want to usually apply it to construct maps that have no signed area. Um, and so let me start just by describing Kaufman's construction. So Kaufman uh, constructed an example of a Lipschitz map F uh, from the cube to the square, which is surjective, and where the rank of the derivative is at most one almost everywhere. And so this is impossible for smooth maps, because if you have a smooth map, you have Sard's theorem. Uh, Sard's theorem tells you that if you have a smooth map where the rank of the derivative is at most one, then the measure of the image is zero. And so the map can't be surjective. But regardless, um, there is a, there, 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 there is a self-similar map. Um, and so let me show you that construction. So, the idea of the construction, we want, to we want to construct a map from a uh, cube. So here's our cube. Can you see that? Let me move that down a little bit. Uh, we want to construct a map from the cube uh, to the square. Uh, let's call our cube Q. Let's call our square D. Um, okay, let me move that just a little bit. Okay. Um, we want to construct a map which is uh, surjective and where the derivative has rank one almost everywhere. And so here's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to take the cube and we're going to decompose it into a grid. Uh, we're going to decompose the, cu the cube into a four by four by four grid. And we're going to take the square and we're going to decompose it into an eight by eight grid. Uh, and the key property of these numbers is that if you have a if you have a four by four grid, four by four by four grid of cubes, it has 64 cubes. If you have an eight by eight grid of squares, it has 64 squares. And so what we can do is we can define subcubes Q1 up to Q64. Uh, these are going to be uh, cubes of side one eighth. Uh, centered in each square, centered in each of the 64 cubes of the grid. Uh, so because this is a four by four by four grid, the cubes in the grid have side length one quarter. And so if I stick a one eighth by one eighth by eight, one eighth cube in the middle, then it just fits in the middle with a little bit of room around it like so. And so I have 64 of these cubes of side length one eighth. And likewise, I have 64 squares in this grid. Let's call them D1 up to D64, uh, also side one eighth. And inside of each of the, uh, inside of each of these squares, I'm going to define, I'm, I'm going to name the center points. I'm gonna call those say P1 through P64 uh, are the uh, grid centers. And then I'm going to define a map. Uh, I want to define a rank one map um, from the complement of the Q sub i's to the one, the one skeleton of the grid. So I'm going to let F be a map from the complement of the uh, cubes to the one skeleton of the grid. Um, Actually, sorry, not the one skeleton of the grid. I, I, I'm just going to map this to 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 the to the to the grid, um, so that the boundary of the big cube maps to the center. Let's call that center uh, P. 
maps to the center of the of the square and the boundaries of each of the little cubes maps to the center of the uh, grid cells or the center of the corresponding grid cell uh, i have the same number of cubes as i have squares and so i can like so 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 that so that's easy to do and then what i'm going to do with everything else is i just all i need is for this to be a lipschitz map which is rank one on the uh, the cube with all these holes drilled, drilled in it. And so all I do is I just draw a line segment from the center of the square to the centers of each of the little squares. And I send the complement of the little cubes to that uh, graph. And so that's rank one, that's Lipschitz. It's so far so good. Now, that leaves the question of how to define the map on the uh, the little the, 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 the Q sub i's on these little cubes. And so what we do we, what we do is we define F on Q sub i by rescaling. Because remember, our original map sent, sent, sent the boundary of the big cube to the center of the big square and the boundaries of the little cubes to the uh, centers of the little squares. So we can, we can let F on QI be a rescaling of F, which is to say, we're gonna take, uh, we're gonna define a map on these little cubes by div dividing each of the little cubes into a four by four by four grid dividing each of the little squares into an eight by eight by eight, into an eight by eight grid. And then we're going to do the same thing on the little cube that we did on the big cube. We're going to send the boundary of the little cube to the center of the little square. And we're going to have little tiny cubes in each grid cell of the little cube. And we're going to send the boundaries of those to the centers of the tiny squares here. And then everything between the little cube and the tiny cubes is going to go to a graph connecting the center of the little square to the center of the tiny squares, right? And so once we do that, that defines the map on each of the Q sub i's. That defines, uh, you know, so 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 now we have a, a, a map which is with the which is lip which which, which is Lipschitz and has a rank one uh, derivative and it's defined on the big cube minus sixty four squared tiny cubes. Is this okay so far? Okay. So 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 we can do this again and again. Uh, repeat on tiny cubes and so on and so forth to define to, to, to define a map on this big cube minus a collection of smaller and smaller cubes. Uh, this defines F on uh, F is defined outside a Cantor set at the end of this construction. And furthermore, because of the way that we chose our cubes, because of the sizes of our cubes, our cubes all have side one eighth, our squares all have side one eighth. So when we do this rescaling, we're rescaling the domain by a factor of eight, we're rescaling the target by a factor of eight. And so the Lipschitz constant stays the same. Uh, the Lipschitz constant, constant uh, stays the same at each scale. Uh, and so F is defined outside a Cantor set and it's Lipschitz outside that Cantor set. So we extend F by continuity. And then what's the result? Uh, well, we have a map which is uh, rank one outside, which is, which is which, to get a Lipschitz map. which is rank one outside the Cantor set.
Uh, but the Cantor set has measure zero, so this is a map which is rank one almost everywhere. And the image of this map, well, as we go down to, to smaller and smaller grid sizes, uh, the image contains the, the grid centers of smaller and smaller grids. Uh, so the image is dense, uh, and so the map is subjective. And so this is Kaufman's construction. It's a surjective uh, Lipschitz map from the cube to the square, uh, which has derivative, which is rank one almost everywhere. Um, but yeah, but, 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 but it's subjective. Is this okay so far? Is this construction okay? Okay, so now... Uh, it reminds one a little bit of, uh, of the devil's staircase construction. Is that... Like the cantor lebesgue function? Yes. Or is this completely unrelated? I mean, there are also you have um you do something uh in an iterative fashion yeah yeah so you so you see you, you, so 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 you, and with the with the cantor lebesgue function uh you don't get a lipschitz function at the end of it because uh because the scale in the domain and the target is is is, is different um but 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 yeah you 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 define a map outside some regions and then you define it in those regions and outside some smaller regions and 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 so on and so forth so forth you define your map and eventually you define your map on the complement of a cantor set yeah um so yeah so so, so this is this this is kaufman's construction um and there, the, there's, a, there's a lot of flexibility here um the and you can you 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 can use you can use different domains, different targets, and the key uh, fact here that makes this work is really uh, that the, the the dimension of the, the of the domain is bigger than the dimension of the target, so that you can do this uh, so that you can have sixty four cubes on one side and sixty four squares on the other side, all of the same size. Um, but yeah, so 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 there's a lot of flexibility here. But there's also a limit to the amount of flexibility you can have here because you can't really get very interesting topology out of this. It always it's always going to factor through a tree, and you can prove this. Um, you can prove that uh, rank uh, maps that, that that are that are Lipschitz and where the derivative is rank one almost everywhere have to factor through an R tree. If M is simply connected and F is a rank one Lipschitz map, then there is an R tree T, so that F is a composition of a map from M to T and a map from T to M. So you can't do you, 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 so you can't have very interesting topology here because it all has to factor through something contractible. But then you can ask, okay, oh sorry, I should say so 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 why is this why why, why does why does the map have to factor through a tree? Well, roughly the reason is that well, Lipschitz maps don't have to satisfy Sard's theorem while you, while you can get the 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 while, while the image doesn't have to measure zero. Lipschitz maps kind of do have to satisfy Stokes' theorem. Uh, the, 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 the image of every closed curve has to have area zero because, you know, if you have a simply if you have a closed curve and a simply connected manifold, it bounds a disk. And then if you look at the image of that disk under a map with uh, where, where the derivative has rank, rank, rank one, Jacobian is zero. And so it has to collapse to something uh, with area zero. The boundary of that curve, the boundary of that disk has to collapse to a curve that bounds a region with area zero, uh, which means that you you the, 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 that curve has to have backtracking. I mean, if, if that curve goes out along some uh, path, then it has to come back along that same path in order to in order to guarantee the measures in, in order to guarantee that it's filled by something with measure zero. Um, and so the boundary of a disk has to collapse onto a tree. And you can use since since that works for every disk, really the whole map has to collapse down. To collapse for for a tree. All disk only for measure one. There may be exceptional disk, no a priori. Yeah, okay. So 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 you have to be <clears> careful <throat> about, you know, if you if, if if you if you put some metric on your manifold where you're simply connected, but you're not Lipschitz simply connected, then 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 yeah, there might there there, 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 there might be uh there might be other maps. Yeah. Is that okay? 
Uh, more or less, yeah, I guess I'm still worried at this point, but I think, I think you're right, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. So, 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 so I guess in, in the statement, I, I should really say that if you have a simply connected manifold with a with a Riemannian metric. Okay. 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 Um, so, so yeah. So rank one maps are are are, are topic topologically trivial, but remarkably. Um, the same is not true for higher rank maps. Uh, so what I want to say, so let's define if we have a Lipschitz map to an n manifold where the rank of the derivative is at most n minus one almost everywhere, let's call that co rank one. The rank is at, at least one less than the dimension of the target. Then Stefan Wenger and I uh, constructed co rank one maps that are that are that are not null homotopic. Co rank one maps that are topologically non-trivial uh, in dimensions above four. So the smallest dimension this works in is that you can construct a map from S5 to S4, uh, which is co-rank one, but not null homotopic. And again, this is something you can't do, um, again, this is something you can't do with a smooth map, again, because of Sart's start theorem. If you have a smooth map from S5 to S4, where the rank of the derivative is three, then the image has measure zero, which means it misses a point on the, on the sphere. And if you have a map that misses a point on the sphere, then it's homotopically trivial, it, 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 then it's contractible. Um, and so how does this work? Well, it follows from the following lemma uh, that if alpha from SM to SN is a map with M greater than N, then the suspension of alpha extends to a co-rank one map on the ball. So the original map is rank n is full rank. You suspend it, that has rank n plus one, and that extends to a map on the ball, which still has rank n plus one. And so let me just first establish a little bit of notation. Um, so you know, if you, if you have a topological space, the suspension is the double cone over that space. Uh, we can write it as, uh, X cross an interval where, and then modulo an equivalence relation where we identify all the points in X cross zero and we identify all the points in X cross one. Um, in particular, the suspension of the M sphere is the M plus one sphere. And we can apply this same construction to a map. If we have a map from M from SM to SN, then the suspension of that map is the map from SM plus one to SN plus one. Uh, that sends the point x comma t in this product structure to alpha of x comma t, and the way that I the, the way that I want to, the way to, the, the way that I want to draw this is I want to think about this in terms of uh, cylindrical coordinates. So the idea is that we have here's our sphere S M. Uh, we take the suspension, so we add two points, one on top, one on bottom, and we cone the sphere off to those two points uh, to get. SM plus one. This is kind of cylindrically symmetric. So if we want to put coordinates on it, a natural way to put coordinates on it is to uh, write points on this in the suspension as basically uh, a radius, an angle, and a z coordinate, where the radius is in R and the z and, and the, the angle is the direction out along the equator. Well, the equator is uh, SM, so that's SM. Uh, and the z-coordinate is in R. And then the suspension of this map, uh, if we have a map from SM to SN, then the suspension of that map is going to be the map that sends this point in polar coordinates to the, to, to, to the point in polar coordinates that you get by applying your original map to that equator factor. Uh, so, 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 I, so I'm, I'm going to view suspensions as sort of maps that can be written in polar coordinates in this way, but in, in polar coordinates as a map that sends rho theta z to rho alpha theta z. Um, and so, the thing I want to show is that if I have a map like this, then I can extend it to, then I can extend it to the 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 the, the, the ball. Uh, in a way that doesn't increase the rank. 
Okay. So how do we do that? Well, again, we're going to do something very similar to what we did in Kaufman's in, in Kaufman's example. Um, so I'm going to take um, I'm going to take my, my my domain. Remember, my domain is going to be a uh, a ball of dimension m plus one. So let's call this uh, Q. And I'm going to have my range. And again, my range is going to be a ball of dimension n plus one. So this is m plus one. This is n plus one. Um, and I'm going to try to do the same sort of thing that I did before. Um, so since m is greater than n, uh, there exists k and L such that uh, 2K is strictly less than L and such that uh, K to the power of M plus one is bigger than uh, L to the power of N plus one. And I'm going to let capital N be uh, L to the N plus one. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm going to divide the domain into a K by K by k grid, I'm going to divide the target into an L by L by L grid. Then by, by my choice of k and L, the number of cells in this grid is bigger than the number of cells in this grid. But also, uh, K is smaller than L. So what I can do is I can do the same thing that I did before. Uh, we can choose N uh, cubes of side one over L. Uh, let's call them Q1 up to QN centered in the grid cells. Those are the same sort of cubes that we saw before, or they are smaller than the grid cells. And I have likewise n uh, 1 over L cubes, uh, D1 up to Dn, which are the grid cells. Now, what I'm going to define is I'm going to define, again, a map from the complement of these holes, uh, this cube with all these holes in it, uh, to, the, uh, to, 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 to the disk. Um, and and I'm going to do that so that um, I'm going to define beta from Q minus the union of the QI uh, to the, I guess the 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 the, 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 co, the, the, the co dimension one skeleton of the target, so that's going to be this n skeleton here, um, which is Lipschitz uh, because. The target is n dimensional. It's going to be rank one, rank n. And then what we're going to ask this to do on the boundary is that we're going to ask that it sends the boundary uh, of the big cube uh, should be homotopic to the suspension of alpha. Uh, and on each little cube uh, should be a rescaling of what it does on the big cube. So you don't have to send boundary to boundary, right? You have to avoid this issue, right? We do. We we want to send so 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 we're, so remember alpha. So 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 I'm thinking of alpha is a map from the boundary of Q to the, uh, sorry, I guess the suspension of alpha is a map from the boundary of Q to the boundary of the disk. Yeah. So, so, the alpha, the big... so you need boundary to go to the boundary or not? 
Yes. So the, the 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 out the outer boundary of the cube goes to the outer boundary of the, the, the cube. Okay. Which is an impossible in dimension in the previous example of Kaufman. Yeah, in in, in, in in the previous example of Kaufman, it doesn't work because there's exactly. no map from the sphere to the uh, circle. I see. Okay. But here we're starting with a with with with, with a map with with, with 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 an element of a higher homotopy group of spheres, and so we can send the the, the boundary of the, the the cube to the boundary, boundary of the and, and, and your homotopy class. Okay. Yeah. Yep. 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 Okay. And so, so yeah, so we're sending the boundary of the big cube to the boundary of the square. We're sending the, sending the boundary of each of the little cubes to the boundary of one of the little squares. And, um, and, and the, the, the only, the, the, now there's an obstruction here because of there, because there's some topology, um, because we want to, we want this to be defined on uh, the cube minus all these little cubes, the complement of all these little cubes. Um, so there's an, there, 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 there's a topological obstruction. And you can you can you you can either you can either do some calculations. Uh, you can you you can show that because this is a suspension, this topological obstruction vanishes. Uh, or you can actually you can you can give a very nice. Uh, there's a, so so this so this is a construction due to uh, Goldstein, uh, Hiwash, and Panka um, to show how to construct this. Uh, this map, uh, the basic idea is that, well, so you have this cube with a bunch of holes in it. Um, this, is, this is homeomorphic to a ball of the same dimension where we just line up the holes along the, uh, the, 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 the north-south axis of the ball then that ball is now cylindrically symmetric uh that ball is now cylindrically symmetric so so we get so so if we have points if we have a point in this ball uh we can identify that point we can write that point with coordinates uh rho theta z and then we can define a map which does the suspension uh which sends rho theta z to rho alpha of theta z this map is going to send the boundary of the sphere to the boundary of a lower dimensional sphere uh, by the suspension of alpha, by sigma alpha. It's going to send each of these little holes here to a bunch of little holes in the uh, lower dimensional ball. Again, it's going to send the boundary of each of these holes to the boundary of each of these holes by, the, by sigma alpha. And this is homeomorphic to a lower dimensional cube with a bunch of square holes in a grid shape. And then there's a natural retraction uh, from the, 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 the cube minus a bunch of holes to just a square grid that we're interested in. And so this composition, where you take the, cube, the, 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 the domain with a bunch of holes, you arrange those holes along a line, uh, you use cylindrical coordinates to map from here to here, uh, and then you rearrange the holes again and retract to the grid, that does exactly what we want on the complement of the holes, on the, on, on the cube minus all these little holes. That's going to be, or at least that's going to be homotopic to our map beta. It's okay. And so once we have that, well, now we've defined a map on the big cube minus a bunch of little cubes. Um, and furthermore, we've defined this map so that the, 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 the definition of the map on the boundary of the big cube is a scaling of the definition of the map on the boundary of each of the little cubes. And so we can rescale and repeat. Exactly the same thing that we did for Kaufman. Um, we define the map on we define beta on Q sub i as a scaling of beta on Q. Um, that's going to define a map on, on Q sub i 
except for some tiny holes, except for some even smaller holes. Uh, and it's going to define a map which sends the, the small cube minus the tiny cube to the n minus one skeleton, the co-dimension one skeleton of some grid in the target. Um, and then we can repeat on the first by, by we can repeat, we can send these tiny cubes to these tiny squares and so on and so forth. Um, and so finally, we can extend by continuity. And again, we have to be worried about what happens to the Lipschitz constants here because we're 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 defining this map by by doing these infinitely many rescalings. But because of our choice of k, because of our choice of cubes here, we're rescaling the cubes in the domain by a factor of l. We're rescaling the cubes in the target by a factor of l, and so, so the Lipschitz constant, the Lipschitz constant stays bounded. So the final result is Lipschitz and rank n. Is this okay so far? Are there any questions about anything so far? Okay, so 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 what does that give us? It, it, it tells us that uh, oops, sorry, I'm bad. Okay, so what does that give us? Um, so remember, we want to show that if n is greater than or equal to four, then there's a co rank one map from S n plus one to S n, which is not null homotopic. And we do that by suspending the hop vibration. Uh, the hop vibration sends S3 to S2, and its suspensions are homotopically non-trivial. Uh, so the extension lemma tells us that if we take the suspension of the hop, uh, of, of the hop vibration, uh, then we can construct a co-rank one map from D4 plus K to D3 plus K uh, so that the boundary is, homo is, is homotopic to the case suspension of the hop vibration. Uh, if you take two of those and you glue them together along the equator, then you get a map from S4 plus K to S3 plus K, uh, which has co-rank one and, the, uh, and is homotopic to the K plus first suspension of the hop vibration. And so this is, a, and I, I've stated this here for the hop vibration because um, because that, that gives that gives you the map with the smallest dimension. That gives you a uh, a map from S five to S four with rank three. But really, um, this works for any map. Uh, if you have a element of pi m of S n where m is greater than n, then this really tells you that the double suspension of that map is a map from S m to S S m plus two to S n plus two, which is homotopic to a map of rank n plus one. It's homotopic to a co rank one map. Um, you can ask whether this generalizes to higher dimensions and higher co-ranks, and we believe it does. Uh, we believe that if k is greater than one, then the two k plus the, the two k suspension of alpha is homotopic to a co-rank k map. The construction is more difficult um, because, well, basically you 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 want to do something very similar. Uh, to what we did here, where 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 you remove a bunch of holes, and then you map it to the uh, the to, you map it to some to, to some skeleton of the target, but the thing you remove, the object that you have to remove from your domain, is more complicated. Instead of being a bunch of cubes, it ends up being that you want to remove a neighborhood of a of a of a, uh, of a k dimensional complex, and things are there there's more topology to keep track of, so. We believe this is true. We're working on writing it up, but it's it, yeah, it, it's a complicated construction. Um, and this should be sharp. Um, the, the, the methods of Larry Guth show that uh, if you take the two k plus first, uh, the two k suspension of the hop vibration, 
then it's not homotopic to a map with co rank k plus one. If you take the 2k minus first suspension, then it's not homotopic to a map with co rank k. Okay. Is this okay so far? So you have to run here on the seminar, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm going to continue, but yeah, thanks for coming. Yeah. Because we may I'll ask you after that, we'll, we'll meet there because I want to go to another seminar. Okay, okay. How long you will talk? You will be you probably have another 10 minutes, yeah? Yeah, about that. Yeah, well, probably well, I will. Um, yeah, um, it's actually about 20 minutes. Ah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, so, yeah, so, so, okay, see you. Yeah. So, so yeah, so 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 the kind of the 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 philosophy the, the the philosophy of this is kind of that. Well, so you so 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 so, so you, you you you. The 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 way that I think about these maps is that you start out with a you start out with a question uh you 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 you, you, you want to you want to construct a map from you have you, you have a map from the boundary of the domain to the boundary of the target and you want to extend that to the interior of the domain and you don't necessarily know how to do that you don't necessarily know how to uh how, how to construct a co-rank one map uh that 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 that, that extends that boundary but what you can do, uh, the idea behind this, these constructions is that, well, you can't you, you can't necessarily figure out how to how to extend the big map all at once. But what you can do is you can take that big map, uh, that map of the big cube, and replace it with a map of a bunch of little cubes, a bunch of little cubes at a smaller scale. Um, and so you you haven't solved your problem. You, but you've you've taken your original problem and you've broken up into a bunch of little problems at a much smaller scale. And the little problems are rescalings of the big problem, and so you can apply the same technique to take those many little problems and replace them with even more tiny problems, and then you replace those very many tiny problems with even more, even smaller problems, and so. You never actually end up solving your problem. You 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 just break it down and 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 and, and, and you just break it down to problems at smaller and smaller and smaller scales. But if you do it inde indefinitely, you don't have to solve your problem in the end. You can just extend by continuity. Uh, so 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 you you end up with these maps uh, where which are based on taking this 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 this, this problem at scale one. And replacing it by many, many problems at smaller and smaller scales. So that's the so 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 so, so, so that's kind of my my the, the my 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 philosophy behind these constructions is that we're just breaking up problems into smaller and smaller problems. And so I have one more application I wanted to show you, or one more one 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 more version of this I wanted to show you, um, which is maps that have signed area zero. Um, oh, so I guess before I should do this, are there any questions about anything so far? Oh, it's very clear, actually. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, 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 yeah. So, 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 I, so, so, I, so, I have one more version of this I want to show you, which is it mapped with signed area zero. Um, so, for a closed curve gamma, I'm going to define sigma of gamma to be the signed area of gamma, which is to say the the integral of the winding number of gamma. Um, and so, if you have a map from the disk to to the disk. Which sends every uh, Lipschitz closed curve to a curve uh, of signed area zero. Then what can you say about that map? Well, if you, if 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 that map is Lipschitz, then it has to collapse. Uh, if, if that map is is Lipschitz, then it then it turns out it has to factor through a tree, uh, because if you have a, a map from the disk to a disk which is which is Lipschitz, then it's differentiable almost everywhere. And so if you pick a point where it has a derivative then a small neighborhood of that point is going to map to an ellipsoid in the target. But then the, the boundary of that small neighborhood, the small circle around that point, that's going to map to an ellipse, uh, to, to, to an ellipse. And the ellipse has signed area non-zero unless the derivative has rank one. But if the derivative has rank one almost everywhere, then we're in the same situation as the Kaufman construction, where uh, a Lipschitz map with rank one derivative 
has to factor through a tree. So, okay, Lipschitz maps with signed area zero have to be topologically trivial. What about, uh, can we, can we, can we re relax the Lipschitz condition? Well, we can't relax it too much because if, if we relax it too much, then if we just look at continuous maps, then you can't define the, can be the signed area of a continuous curve because curves like Brownian motion don't really have a well-defined signed area. But you can define the, the signed area of Hilder curves. Uh, if alpha is between zero and one, uh, a map is alpha Hilder. If there's some L greater than zero, such that for all points X1 and X2 in the domain, uh, the distance between f of x1 and f of x2 is at most l times the distance between x1 and x2 raised to the power of alpha. Um, when alpha is 1, this is exactly the Lipschitz condition. When alpha is less than 1, this is a, this is a, this, this is a weaker condition. Uh, one, one holder is equivalent to Lipschitz. Epsilon holder is a little bit better than uniform continuity, but not that much better than uniform continuity. And so the bigger this exponent or the closer this exponent is to one, the nicer the map. In particular, uh, if you have an alpha Hilder curve with alpha bigger than one half, then it has a well-defined signed area. And so you can define this notion of a map with signed area zero, a map that sends every Lipschitz closed curve to a Hilder curve with uh, signed area zero. And uh, Ladona and Sust, uh, show that when alpha is bigger than two thirds, then an alpha Hilder map with signed area zero has to factor through a tree. Uh, and this uses Gromov's work on alpha Hilder maps to the Heisenberg group because um, these maps with signed area zero really correspond to maps of the Heisenberg group, but I just don't want to talk about the Heisenberg group uh, or I don't have time to talk about the Heisenberg group too much. Um, so, you can ask, so, so that leaves a gap uh, between alpha one half and alpha two thirds where um, where where, 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 where where this is open, it turns out that in that gap, you can define maps with signed area zero. It makes sense to talk about maps with signed area zero, but the signed area zero condition doesn't really restrict the topology at all. Uh, when alpha is between one half and two thirds, then any Lipschitz curve uh, with signed area zero can be extended to an alpha Hilder map uh, with signed area zero. Uh, so basically a curve with signed area zero you know, is basically a figure eight. This is saying that we can extend that figure eight to the disk uh, so that any closed curve in the disk maps to a closed curve with signed area zero. So again, so let me show you, so, so let me show you how to do, how, how to do this. Um, so again, it's gonna be very, it, it, it's gonna be, it's gonna have a very similar flavor where we, we have, we have a problem that we don't know how to solve, which is how to extend this, uh, the, 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 this figure eight to the disk. And so what we're, going to, we're, what we're going to do is we're going to break it down into a bunch of smaller problems that we still can't solve, but then we can break those into smaller problems and smaller problems and so on. So here we're constructing a map from the disk uh, to the plane uh, where the boundary of the disk is going to map to a uh, curve of signed area zero, let's say this figure eight here. Uh, so let's call this map gamma. Let's call our disk D. Um, and so what we're going to do is the following. Um, the first step we need to do is we need to subdivide gamma. Uh, we need to break this one big, one, one big figure eight into a bunch of little curves. Um, and so this, I think I'm gonna need a little bit more space. So let me take this picture here. So we want to subdivide this curve gamma into a bunch of smaller curves that all also have signed area zero. And so we're going to let k be large. And then we're going to fill this, we're going to subdivide this big figure eight into a bunch of little figure eights. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to take this picture, we're going to cone it off to a point like so. Uh, so slices of this cone uh, look like figure eights, like so. And then we're going to divide this cone into k squared uh, strips. So we're going to draw k squared scalings of the original figure eight 
And so one of our strips is gonna look like that and we have K squared of those strips. We're gonna then take each of those K squared strips, our strips, uh, so, so maybe this is, a, this, is a piece of a, this is a piece of one of these strips. Uh, so the distance from one, side to the, the, for, for, from one side to the other is about one over K squared. Uh, we're gonna take each of these and we're going to divide them into uh, K segments. So the distance from here to here is going to be about one over K. Now, what can we say about these strips? So each of these strips uh, has signed area zero because it's based on a curve with, uh, we, 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 it's based on a curve with signed area zero. But also because we started with the curve of length approximately one, and we're making these strips where the length of the strip is about one, the width of the strip is about k about, about one over k squared. The total area of each strip is about one over k squared. The problem here is that if we if we subdivide the strips exactly like this, uh, these are rectangles that are one over k by one over k squared. But these are rectangles. These have find area about one over k cubed. Uh, so these are not valid subdivisions because their they're, they're signed area is too big. But we can correct that. Instead of connecting, instead of cutting the strip up just by straight lines like that, uh, we can cut this, we can we can cut the strip by uh, basically draw a path from here to here that has a big loop in the middle. And that if I make this loop the right size, then this piece is going to have signed area zero. And that loop is gonna be pretty small because the area that I had to cancel out was pretty small. The problem is that I haven't really gotten rid of that area. I haven't really gotten rid of that signed area. All that's happened is that now that signed area is part of the next segment of the strip. And now I have now I have a region bounded by a curve like this, which has even bigger signed area. And so I'm going to need to add an even bigger loop on the side to cancel that out and so on and so forth. But this strip is so narrow, the total area of this strip is so small that the, the area of the loops that I, never, uh, that I add never gets bigger than one over K squared. The length of the curves that I need to add, the length of the loops I need to add never gets bigger than one over K. And so the end result of this is that I take my original curve with signed area zero and I subdivide it into K squared strips. And then I subdivide each strip into K regions with signed area zero. The final result is that I can subdivide gamma into uh, K cubed uh, smaller curves, uh, gamma one up to gamma K cubed with sigma gamma i equals zero. And the length of gamma i is at most, say, c over k. Um, and then, well, that subdivides the target curve. I need to do a subdivision of the domain. So let's subdivide the domain into a grid. Uh, how many squares do I need in the grid? Well, I'm going to need about k cubed squares in the grid. So let's let n square equal k cubed. Uh, and let d1 up to d k cubed be squares of side length 1 over 2n in the domain. So that's gonna be little squares like that. Um, and then we do exactly the same thing that we've been doing, this same rescaling construction. Uh, we let F define, we define F on the, uh, on, on, on the big square minus the union of little squares. It's gonna send the boundary of the big square to gamma. It's gonna send the boundary of the little squares to these little cur curves gamma i. 
Um, and what happens in between? Well, basically we have some mesh, we have some, we, we have some graph that we've drawn in, in the plane made up of all these little subdivisions, gamma i, and we're just going to send everything between the big, the big square and the little squares, we're just going to send it to that graph. So everything between the big square and the little squares has rank one, everything between the, the big squares and the little squares has signed area zero. Um, And so, so far, we've constructed a map where the image of any Lipschitz closed curve that avoids the little squares has signed area zero. The only thing left to do is to extend it to the little squares. And we use the same construction that we've been doing. We rescale and repeat on the little squares. Now, this is slightly different than what we've done before because we're no longer scaling by the same size uh, in the domain and the range. Uh, we, we, we go from a curve of length one to little curves of length C over K. We go from a square of side length one to squares of side length one over two, two, one over two N. Um, so the domain scales by two N, the range, by uh, C over K or K over C. And so this is alpha holder for uh, an exponent, which is the log of the scale in the target divided by the log of the scale in the domain. And this converges to two thirds as, uh, as K goes to infinity. So, as so 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 as we increase the, uh, the, the the as we increase k as we increase the number the 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 the, the, the squares in the grid and the the subdivisions for the curve, uh, the Hilder exponent that arises from this gets closer and closer to two thirds, and so. In uh, end, we get uh, this Robert, uh, I'm Robert. I have a question. Is the limit map um, is it still absolutely continuous? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so this is, uh, so, 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 so this is going to be so, so, so because what's what what's happening is well, basically the on each on the region between the 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 the, the, the original square and the little squares, it's Lipschitz with some constant. On the region between the little squares and tiny squares, it's Lipschitz with a larger constant, and so on and so forth. So if you have two points to get that are close together, then either they're, you know, either they're in the gap between two of these regions, in which case it's bounded by that Lipschitz constant, or, you know, you can't skip from over here to over here because their points are too close together. And so you have a you have uniform continuity because, you know, points that are very close together almost have to be in the same square. Okay. So yeah, so 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 you get you so you have uniform continuity. In fact, you have you better than that. You have you have alpha Hilder with where the where alpha is getting closer and closer to two thirds. It's okay. Okay. Um, and so yeah, so 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 the, 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 this this gives us maps with 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 signed area zero. Um, these are related to questions about the Heisenberg group. I don't want to go to to I don't want to go. I don't have time to get into the Heisenberg group, but I can show you a couple of pictures. So this is this is this is the Heisenberg group. These are some curves in the Heisenberg group, um, and the Heisenberg group is a is a is a, a sub-Riemannian manifold where the horizontal distribution looks like this. Um, and so Gromov asked a question about what are the alpha Hilder maps from the disk or from the, uh, the ball to the Heisenberg group and gave a lower bound on the, or, on, on, or, or, or gave, and gave one bound on what happens, which is that any surface in the Heisenberg group has Hausdorff dimension at least three. And so when alpha is bigger than two thirds, there's no, there's no alpha Hilder embedding from the disk to the Heisenberg group because the image of the disk would have to be a surface. The image would have to have Hausdorff dimension at least three. And the Hausdorff dimension of the image of a, of a disk under a Hilder map is bounded in terms of the Hilder exponent. Uh, so if you have an embedding of the disk into the, the Heisenberg group, it has to increase a two-dimensional object to a three-dimensional object, which means that the Hilder exponent has to be less than uh, two thirds. 
And a lot of the uh, theorems I stated for signed area zero maps really apply to uh, Hoder maps to the Heisenberg group or, or were originally proved in the context of Hoder maps to the Heisenberg group. So this theorem of Obermann and Zust um, was really a, a theorem about a theorem that says that if you have an alpha Hoder map to the Heisenberg group with alpha bigger than one half, then it's the lift of a signed area zero map from the disk to R2. Uh, this, theor this theorem that when alpha is greater than two thirds and an alpha Hoder map factors through a tree, that's really a theorem about Hoder maps to the Heisenberg group. And um, so, this is, so, so, so Hiwash, Mira, and Shikara uh, found numerical results that suggested that there could be Hoder maps with alpha bigger than one half. And in fact, this construction tells you that there are. Uh, this construction tells you that when alpha is between one half and two thirds, then any Lipschitz closed curve in the Heisenberg group can be extended to an alpha Hoder map from the disk to the Heisenberg group. And in fact, it gives you a, a, a density result. Uh, when alpha is between one half and two thirds, the set of alpha Hoder maps is dense in the uh, continuous maps from, from the disk to the Heisenberg group. And in fact, uh, I've given a two-dimensional construction here. In fact, you can extend that to higher dimensional constructions. You can construct uh, Hilder maps from, from balls into the Heisenberg group, uh, which have the same sort of flexibility properties with a variation of this construction. So, um, so yeah, so that's pretty much all I want to say. Um, so a couple of questions remain. One, Gromov's original question, or one of Gromov's original questions, was about Hilder embeddings from the disk to the Heisenberg group. This map doesn't produce embeddings because, uh, well, you have this whole region between the big square and the little squares, which is, which maps to this graph, which maps to all these subdivisions of curves, which has rank one. And so this map collapses um, a lot of points. It's not it's not it's not really an embedding. Can you find an embedding? And really, this, this, this talk is kind of just about this, this, this technique of, of, of taking a problem and breaking it down into a bunch of smaller problems and then, try, and then, then breaking the smaller problems into smaller problems and so on and so forth. Um, I've given you a couple of examples of, of what I've used this for, but I, I, I'd be really curious to see what, uh, what other things can be done this way. So thank you. 